Next speaker, who comes from a different background, which is Fidel Takori, who is chair of the British Arab Foundation. Fidel established the British Arab Foundation in 2011. This is a pioneering not-for-profit organization that is committed to encouraging the integration of minority communities. As chairman of this organization, he continues to campaign and advance this objective. Voluntary work has always been very important to Fidel, and he has served various not-for-profit organizations in various roles. He's a seasoned activist, and one of his most recent campaigns includes end to FGM. So I'd now like to welcome him uh, to, to speak about this issue. Good morning, and thank you, Coventry, for organizing this wonderful conference. Coventry has been a leading light in the fight against FGM. Uh, many months ago, when I approached many councils, Coventry was the lead. I found myself pushing on an open door. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lucas. Thank you, Councillor Gingell. I, when I asked for a meeting, it was forward coming. When I was speaking, I felt that I did not need to carry on because they, they understood it, they got it. And very quickly, they pushed for a motion in the council. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure many women and men, future women and men, will appreciate your stand. I'll start by saying something about the British Arab Federation. Uh, w these are our aims, uh, which are simple and can uh, be read. We are a campaigning organization. We are not uh, for profit. We do not think we have the human resources, the manpower and the woman power to do delivery of services. So we limit ourselves to campaigns. And some of the campaigns we've been in in involved in is uh, bringing back weekly wage because uh, we believe that one of the problems that enable Bay Day lenders is the fact that people don't get their wages on time. And another campaign we recently launched is to find a research with Aston University is to find why ethnic minorities and in particular Arabs and Afro-Arabs <coughs> are not involved in the civic and political life of Britain. We think this has to end, and if anybody wants to support us on this, we will welcome your support. Uh, our FGM campaign started in 2012, and since then we launched a, a social media campaign. We reached about 100,000 people. Believe it or not, out of the 100,000, we only got two people, two who's saying, why are you doing this? This is wrong. And when we looked on, on the profile of these two, two people, they actually oppose everything and anything, and they don't come from communities that practice FGM. So as a practice, it doesn't have intellectual support whatsoever. It's done under the carpet. Nobody is standing up and saying, I'm going to do it. I believe in it. It's beneficial. Uh, we held a conference in Birmingham with uh, West Midlands Police, and I would like to thank them. And uh, bless his soul, uh, Bob Jones, the police commissioner. And it was a very successful conference. We had the community. We had Muslim scholars. We had uh, the police officers and the uh, police commissioner. And I think the outcome was is <clears throat> the community understood how bad it is to do this in this country and what are the repercussions? What are the, it's, it's a crime and it's a, it, it holds a custodial sen sentence. As well, the police officers and <clears throat> had an opportunity to communicate with the community activists and community members and get a feedback of what their feelings are. We worked with uh, Muslim scholars to produce a fatwa, this fatwa it could be used as a sermon for, uh, you're a kind man, thank you. I'll tell you how Coventry is good. 
they get it. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fatwa which we worked with uh, Shia and Sunni scholars to produce, uh, it could be used as a sermon in mosques, it could be used as a lecture to be delivered and demonstrate that it has nothing with Islam. It has nothing with religion. And the, we written to all members of parliament a few times. At the very beginning, we had uh, some cold shoulders. Uh, but eventually, I think every member of parliament who written to either written back or uh, supported our campaign. We pushed for councils to adopt a motion against FGM. And to their credit, uh, Coventry is still the only council who took the motion in, uh, into the council house, supported by all members, whether uh, conservatives uh, and uh, labor members of the city council. Uh, we're still working with other councils, and I'm sure many will follow. Uh, we worked with the LGA, Again, uh, I think I was nominated uh, by Anne Lucas to work with the LGA. And over the last year, we worked on a back to help councils through, you know, up and down the country to confront and combat FGM. When you ask people, why do they do FGM? You got um, a multitude of answers. Some will say it's our tradition. Others will say it's our religion. Some will say it helps chastity. Or even people believe it enhances fertility. Or for some, they claim it gives the man a better sex life. When you scrutinize any of these reasons, they're all fallacies. None of them is true. What is really the true reason that FGM is practiced? In my view, and in the British Arab Federation view, it's means of control. And it's the fear of women uh, having, about well, bringing shame onto the family. This is common among these communities. It's the same reasons that some communities practice honor killing, or so-called honor killing. It's the same reasons people do not want to have girls in these communities. It's the belief that if you do FGM, you switch the desire off, and thus you have control. We have to confront this. We have to convince them that it doesn't work. The true reason is control. The true reason is to prevent women from enjoying sexual life, and thus guarantee loyalty within the family life, or to prevent sex outside and before marriage. The immigrant communities, they tend to have a stronger hold on traditional values than where they come from. Believe it or not, in East Africa, the attitude to FGM is better than it here in the UK or in Europe among communities that practice it. It's the belief that if you hold on to the, your traditions, you are more loyal to your roots. Uh, this is not new and not strange. Someone said that the last foot binding happened in California some 50 years after it was stopped in China. That's why we have to confront it here, we have to do everything in our power to explain it, uh, demonstrate that it's the wrong thing, and establish the intellectual basis for rejecting it. We have to deliver a message to the young men and women in these communities, in particular, and in particular men, we have to convince them that desire is much more deep and cannot be switched off by FGM. And as well, we have to win the argument that desire is not such a bad thing after all. It helps family life and enrich it. 
And we have to convince men and women of young age that love and self-respect is the only guarantee for loyalty. FGM doesn't do it. For the community at large, we have to win the argument that it's religious men or religion men who benefit from controlling the society who are advocating FGM. The religious text forbids it, whether it's in Islam, Christianity, Ju Judaism, or any other religion. A number of enlightened scholars here in the UK uh, helped us to produce a fatwa, as well Al Azhar University, which is the oldest established Muslim school in Egypt, and I think throughout the world, in two 2006, they produced a comprehensive fatwa against FGM. We have to convince them that the physical and mental harm is lasting and damaging. We have to talk to parents that the most important thing a parent can give to their child is the love and protection. Once the child realized that she was attacked by her parents, imagine how, how does that child feel for the rest of their life. They feel that the, these are the people charged with their protection, with their enabling. And what they did is to attack the child and disable them. So we have to explain this to parents fully and without beating about the bush. Again, we have to establish it, last but not least, that FGM is a crime, and it carries a custodial sentence of 14 years, I believe. That is a message that should be delivered, clear and loud. I believe to end FGM, we all have a role to play. For the public and statutory bodies, the government, the council, schools, housing, police, health service, we all have to have a clear and consistent message. We all need to focus more on prevention. In July of this year, the Home Office produced a, a resource back. It's good. Unfortunately, it's up to schools in that resource back, up to schools and colleges, whether they use how to, or how they come back FGM. I think we have to be consistent. We cannot have it that this, this government, you know, the government and its agencies have to be consistent. We cannot give two different messages. It's up to schools to confront it or how they confront it. I think all schools, and I very much welcome Seema's commitment, that all schools should have uh, at some information, some way of combating FGM. It should become part of sex education. I very much believe that the police, especially here in the West Midlands, are doing a lot of work, but they've, you know, they're frustrated by the lack of tools. The law have to be changed or revisited. The act itself, even as it was amended in 2003, is too complex and it hinders prosecution. Hence, I think we only having last two cases through the courts, I'm not sure. But if the law was good enough and we know that FGM is being practiced, there would have been prosecutions. I know the the law needs to be visited and rewritten in such a way that would help poli keen police officers to do the deed. Imagine that if a child is attacked in Heathrow Airport, the attacker will be prosecuted, whether the child is British or not. I hope so, at least. But if a child undergoes FGM here in Coventry, if the child is not British, the perpetrators cannot be prosecuted because the law is written to apply only to British children. I think that has to, end, to be ended now. Again, I believe if a child is taken overseas, 
there is no way of prosecuting the perpetrators. Again, the law has to be extended to do that. And I look forward to SEMA's commitment on this. We have to make promotion of FGM a crime. There is plenty of material on the internet which promotes FGM. We have to deal with this. We have to stop it from reaching, and those who promote it have to be made criminals. Recently, the serious crime bill going through, I think, the House of Lords, we put with the LGA an amendment to the serious crime bill to, the, to make it a crime to promote FGM, whether to intend, to intend to practice it or just advocate it. And if any of you have an organization, please write to the Home Office and encourage them to adopt this change to the bill. Of course, voluntary organizations and community organizations have a great role to play. Mosques, churches, and I say churches because some uh, churches here in, in UK which represent uh, people from uh, Thubia, Egypt, Eritrea, and other places, they are silent about it. Uh, Sunday Arabic schools, English schools, community radios, they, I believe they all have to sign up to a minimum standards. All these organizations receive public support. In return, we have to develop something like a kite mark, which says, I'm against FGM at least. Mosques, I believe, they should at least agree to a minimum of two or three sermons a year against FGM. It's not a, it's not a, lot, a lot to ask. Mosques keep repeating the same sermon day in, day out. If we help them to develop a sermon against FGM, I think it should be accepted and practiced. Community radios, they should make it part of their agenda at least once a month to speak about it. We as the, uh, the council or the government should demand this, and we as the concerned people of the public, the great British public, should demand this of these organizations. It's not a lot to ask. Last but not least, I think we should empower women from these communities to become activists and part of the decision making. We should encourage women from ethnic minorities that practice this to become counselors, police officers, health workers, midwives, nurses, and teachers, social workers, because people listen better to, their, to the people who understand them and they perceive them as not the outsiders. Where I come from, we have a saying, nothing scratches your skin like your own nails. That's why we have to see Somali women, Yemeni women, teachers, health workers, and people who take the lead against FGM. Thank you.